Welcome to Reflections, a show that seeks to examine if others see God in your reflection and how Scripture relates to us in this day and age. Peace and all God's blessings be with you. I am Father Bob Janine, pastor of Mission St. Sergius in Bacchus, an all-inclusive, inviting, welcoming, old Catholic ministry serving all of New England, especially nursing homes, hospices, and shut-ins, but also our parishes, assisting at our parishes in Fall River, Massachusetts, in West Warwick, Rhode Island, in Rehoboth, and we have a parish down in New London, Connecticut. And other than Mission St. Sergius and Bacchus, we have outreach ministry to the homeless and to prisons up in New Hampshire. And I've entitled this reflection, One God, One Truth, One Faith, One Church. Today's readings reinforce and repeat the one common theme of Christ's teachings, and it is that we have complete faith and trust in Almighty God. From the first reading taken from the book of Deuteronomy to the Gospel, the theme is the same and is one we should reflect upon every day of our lives. It is, if only you would heed the voice of the Lord. The word of God is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for your observance. You'll find that in Deuteronomy 30, verses 10 through 14. The word of God and God's truth can be found naturally within our hearts if we but listen to that inner voice each of us has naturally. It's a wonderful gift of God. And the inner voice is usually the voice that's suggesting and guiding you to do what is right. It's not that other voice, that exterior voice that's telling you to, hey, you want to do this, you're going to like it. Yeah. Satan often uses the idea that we're going to like something and we're going to enjoy something. But it's not always the right thing to do. In today's world, there are all kinds of experts who try to tell us everything we should be doing from what clothes to wear what food to eat, what we should think, where should we should spend our vacation, and even, unfortunately, what God is thinking. Now, I don't know how anyone can say what God is thinking unless they're taking that from the good news. Or, as it occasionally has happened in history, God actually speaks to them. Now, I don't ever claim that God told me. No. There are times that that in a voice, I, or I feel that I should say this or do this, or I should write this. And yeah, that might be God inspiring me. But I'm not going to get up there. And there have been preachers who said, God told me. Well, what was it that God told you? Oh, that I had to, you had to build this mega church. Oh, okay. 
And why did God need that? Because God has built the best and most magnificent church ever. Nature. By the ocean, in the woods. One of the most beautiful and peaceful and restful and spiritually and uplifting places I have ever been in my life was a piece of woods up in Vermont, in Barry, Vermont, to be exact, where when you went in, it was almost like you were in a super cathedral. The palm trees reached up to the heavens and were all in perfectly straight lines, as if they were columns or pillars supporting this roof of pine branches and the carpet of pine needles on the ground as you walked along and the wonderful scent of almost of like incense in a church and the quiet and the peace where you could pray and meditate. It was a wonderful and spiritually uplifting experience. Many years later, I went there to that same spot. And there were condominiums there. They actually mowed down all of these magnificent trees and put up condominiums. Another spot, a beautiful cathedral, was up on the ocean in California with the ocean there and the sun set and the beautiful colors radiating better than any stained glass could ever create. And again, an overwhelming feeling of God's peace and love. God doesn't need magnificent magnificent, huge buildings, ornate and gilded. God doesn't need that. He's created some of the finest and most beautiful things in his own world in nature. Second Sunday's second reading is a proclamation affirming that Jesus Christ was and is the Son of God, sent by the Father to proclaim God's truth and God's will for us. And not only with some obscure thing, but very clear. Christ did not mince words. He did not use glossy words language. He went straight to the jugular, straight to the point, made it very clear. First Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. He is the image of the unseen God and the firstborn of all creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, everything visible and everything invisible, thrones, dominations, sovereignties, powers, all things were created through and for him. Now the church is his body. He is its head. As he is the beginning, he was the first to be born from the dead, so that we should be the first in every way because God wanted all perfection to be found in him and all things to be reconciled through him and for him, everything in heaven and everything on earth, when he made peace by his death on the cross. The he that Paul is talking about is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, sent from the Father. Why? to make it clear, like it had never been made clear before, 
what God really wants. The major points of our faith are, one, God did indeed create all things and all people with their color, sexuality, idiosyncrasies, and we should not ever presume to know his reason for doing so. Do I need to repeat that? I think I should. God did indeed create all things and all people with their color, sexuality, idiosyncrasies, as he wanted them. And we, we should never, ever presume to know his reasons for doing so. That's the first thing we need not do. Number two, everything was created through God and for God, and it is he who holds all things in unity, meaning that he had a purpose for everything he created them and how he created them. This being the case, why do we ever presume to question why or make judgments on God's plan? Hmm? Why? Everything that God created had a reason. It had a purpose. And sometimes we discover the purpose. We discover that something that we thought was ugly or bad actually has medicinal purposes and are good. So we should never, ever, presume to question why or make judgments on why God did one thing or another. Three, Christ is the head of the church. Not a human being. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. All the other people the popes and the patriarchs, all of them are God's servants who are to ensure that God's will and plan is carried out. Christ is the first in all things. All perfection can be found in Christ's teachings and in his example. If we look at how Christ lived as he traveled this earth, and we try to follow and do that, we're going to be okay. All things on earth and in heavens can be resolved through turning to and living by Christ's teachings and example. Sunday's Gospel then affirms and clarifies very clearly the basic and fundamental teachings of Christ and how we are to achieve everlasting life and salvation. I'm going to read it to you. There was a lawyer who, to the disconcert, Jesus stood up and said to him, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Christ said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with your entire mind, and love your neighbor as, your, as yourself. Christ replied to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Can't be any simpler. Can't be any simpler. Love the Lord your God with your whole mind, 
your whole body, with all your strength, with your soul, with your heart, with everything that you have, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. When pressed by the man as to who his neighbor was, Christ told the story of the Good Samaritan, where a man was robbed and left to die on the side of the road. A priest and a member of the tribe of Levi passed the person and crossed to the other side of the road so as not to come near the dying man. And the story ends in this way, and again, I'll read it. A Samaritan traveler who came upon him was rude with compassion when he saw him. He went up and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. He then lifted him on his own mount, carried him to the inn, and looked after him. The next day he took out two denarii and handed them to the innkeeper, telling the innkeeper, Look after him, and on my way back I will make good any extra expense you have. Jesus asked, Which of these three do you think proved himself a neighbor to the man who fell into the brigand's hands? The lawyer replied, The one who took pity on him. Jesus said to him, Go and do the same yourself. That's what we're being told to do. To worry about the other person. When we see somebody in need, we need to help them. When we need to see somebody who's homeless, we need to try to find a way to give them shelter. When we need to see somebody who needs food, we need to supply that. Even if it means taking away some of our food. We even have that story in Scripture. Failure to live in that way is failure to live as God wants. If we're not living up to the greatest commandment, it doesn't matter how much we pray, or how we pray, or how many times we attend church. We're not fulfilling what Christ and Almighty God wanted us to do. We're not living the Word. The Roman Church, in a paper issued July of 2007, recognized that the Orthodox churches, the Old Catholic Church, and other denominations who can trace their apostolic succession directly back to the apostles are indeed valid members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church that we proclaim belief in every time we say the Nicene or the Apostles' Creed. So, all you people out there, whether you're Roman Catholic, whether you're Old Catholic, whether you're Episcopal, Anglican, Lutheran, Presbyterian, any church, whether you're Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, matters not. You are a member of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and you need to live in accord with the teachings of Jesus Christ, because the same teaching is found in all of the Bibles. The papal letter of 2007 states, Because these churches, although separated, have true sacraments, and above all, because of the apostolic succession, the priesthood and the Eucharist, by means of which they remain linked to us by very close bonds, they merit the title of particular or local churches, and are called sister churches of the particular Catholic churches. That's what this ministry is, Mission St. Sergius and Bacchus. We are Catholic. Our Mass is identical to the Mass in your local Roman parish.
The Eucharist is the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The sacrament of reconciliation is the same. Confirmation is the same. Matrimony is the same. If you are living according to the great commandment, loving God above all things, and loving your neighbor as you love yourself, worrying about the needs of others and not just your own needs, you are living the faith. Now, are you practicing it by acts, by deeds? The bottom line and the major message of this week's readings is that Christ only founded one church. Whether it's Lutheran, Anglican, Episcopal, Roman Catholic, Old Catholic, Matter, it's all part of the one holy Catholic apostolic church established by Jesus Christ through the apostles. It doesn't matter whether you're attending the Tridentine liturgy, a Norvis Ordo liturgy, a revised Roman Missal liturgy, you're still practicing the faith. What matters is that you are living as Christ instructed and placing God first and foremost by setting time apart every single week for God. A special time. And actually, you should send a special time every day to communicate with God. It's called prayer. It doesn't just have to be the Our Father or a Hail Mary or a Rosary. It can be Almighty and Merciful God. I'm sorry. I, today I failed. I, I used bad language or whatever it might be. He hears you. And he will forgive you. Yeah, you do have to go to reconciliation at least once a year during the Easter season. But it's good maybe every month or every couple of months. Now, depends on your life and how many times you mess up. But reconciliation is, is a wonderful grace. And for those of you that aren't quite familiar with the word reconciliation, it's, con it's confession. Yeah. What matters is living as Christ instructed, placing God first and foremost, and following Christ's example by respecting all God's children, by looking out for their well-being and safety. A true man of God, Brother Roger of Taizé, was not a Roman Catholic. He died the death of a martyr and said in unison with Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the two of them together, said, We are both of us challenged by the suffering of the modern world. Confronted with all the wounds of humanity, we find the division between Christians unbearable. Are we ready to set aside our separations, freeing ourselves from fear of one another? When people differ, what use is there in trying to find who is right and who is wrong? In our search for reconciliation, 
Are we ready to learn ways of offering the best of ourselves, of welcoming what is best in others, of loving each other in the way that Jesus loves us? Those words were a proclamation issued by Brother Roger of Taizé, a wonderful, spiritual, God-fearing, loving, non-Roman Catholic whose order he founded lives on in many countries across the world, including right here in the United States. He was martyred while at prayer, shot by a crazed woman. Mother Teresa of Calcutta and Brother Roger often met, and they issued that statement. I want to read it again. I want to read it again because it is so powerful. We are both of us challenged by the suffering of the modern world. Confronted with all the wounds of humanity, we find the division between Christians unbearable. Are we ready to set aside our separations, freeing ourselves from fear of one another? When people differ, what use is there in trying to find out who's right or who is wrong? In our search for reconciliation, are we ready to learn ways of offering the best of ourselves, of welcoming what is best in others, of loving each other in the way that Jesus loves us? That's a powerful message. And I implore each and every one of you who hears in this show or who reads the printed version of this reflection to go forth from this very day living a life of faith and trust in God and extending love toward all of God's children even when it's sometimes difficult because of an individual's personality or negativity. I strive. I strive in spite of how difficult it sometimes is to protect that love toward and project that love toward all I encounter on my journey down the road of life. I pray each and every day Almighty and merciful God, open my mind, my heart, and my soul to your infinite love. Instill within me the knowledge of your truth. Guide me in all of your ways, so that I may be unto others a reflection of your love towards them. Allow the light of your truth to flow through me towards them, in order that they may come to know you better. I pray that all those with whom I encounter each and every day may be brought into a closer union with you and enjoy the gift of your salvation earned through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. I humbly implore you and ask this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. It's one God, forever and ever. Christ founded only one church, and that church, like our body, has many parts, but they're all part of the one body, the one church. So let us open ourselves up, and let us strive, and let us pray for unity as Pope Francis has been praying since he became elected as the Pope. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, he, the Holy Spirit inspired all those cardinals in the conclave to elect this man of God, who chose the name Francis, who is the seraphic father of all Franciscans, St. Francis, as his name because Francis 
exuded peace and love toward even the lepers who he once used to despise. Let us love one another and go forth from this moment. And my prayer is, may God bless you and keep you. May he let his light shine upon you and fill you with his infinite mercy and love. Until we meet again, I ask you, please, please visit our website. And where you see the donation button, click on it. It will take you to PayPal. And there you can safely make a donation to our ministry through PayPal that is safe and secure using a credit card or a debit card. And on our website, if you don't want to do that, you'll find the address and how you can send a donation directly to our missions bank. All the information is there on our website, www.missionstergius.org. Until we meet again, pace a bene. God's blessings be with you. This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.